Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. A diesel-powered engine on a farm works hard and operates in a grueling environment. Soy biodiesel fuels stand up to the challenge of powering farm equipment, but are also renewable and environmentally responsible as well. The Nebraska Soybean Board is committed to encouraging the use of soy biodiesel to protect the environment and sustain Nebraska's agriculture. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal, television for making agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Mike Briggs gives us his thoughts on the cattle markets. Greg Kruger looks at the condition of Nebraska's winter wheat crop. Daryl Martin weighs the use of preseason irrigation. And Tom Hunt explains UNL research trying to find an aphid resistant soybean variety. Mike Briggs is our marketing analyst this week. With grilling season around the corner, or a corner depending on this week's weather forecast, livestock producers are hoping to see an increase in consumer demand for meat. With small exceptions, cattle markets have seen help over the last few weeks. That includes a favorable set of USDA reports last Thursday. Yeah, it was kind of unexpected, but it really helped us out. It dropped our feed costs a dollar in two days. That was really shocking. All the government did was add two weeks worth of usage, and the market took a dollar away in two days, which was very shocking, but it really helps us out. It doesn't make the world all that much better, but it, it helps a lot. How do you view it? Do you view it as that's the bottom now? That's a really great question. It very well could be. It all depends on what the weather's like. The government put in really lofty expectations for not only for planted acres, but also for yield. And I think that yield, that yield number is going to be really hard to achieve unless you have really good, timely rains all year long because the subsoil is so bad, at least in western Iowa and into Nebraska. You know, east of west, you know, the eastern Iowa and Illinois and Indiana are, are they're pretty much recharged. For the people that, you know, don't follow this industry that closely, taking that much off of corn, how much does it help you from what you've been paying for the past, you know, really, if you go back a year? Well, I bought corn yesterday for the cheapest I've bought corn in over a year. It's the first time I bought corn under $7 in probably a year. I'd have to look. And that helps a lot. For every every dollar, you know, that's, that adds, adds up really, really quite fast. The uh, cattle market on the other side, you've done pretty well over the past two weeks with well, today's fighting it a little bit and yesterday wasn't great. Well, it's, it's trying and I didn't come up with this term. I read this, but I thought it was very, very good description of the market. We had an anticipatory bull. Everybody and their dog, even your barber, knew that we were going to get short on cattle and we kept running that board up in anticipation of us running out of cattle. Well, we turned the corner into the first year and we never really ran out of cattle. In fact, we were kind of swamped with cattle and demand was not very good. And down this thing went, it really tanked hard. I didn't think it would tank like this. I don't know anybody that did. Well, we've got it to a bottom and now we're trying the mark, the mark, the futures market is kind of saying, okay, cash market, prove to me that there's no cattle out there. And not only that you're short numbers, but that somebody actually wants it because for the first two months of the year, nobody really wanted it. So hopefully here, as the grills come out of the garage, if it would ever warm up, you know, maybe we can grind this thing higher. Where does the proof come from? I mean, when? You've got to see demand come from the retail sector. Most beef still moves through retail. We've got to see demand come out of the retail sector. And quite frankly, the weather, especially on the East Coast, where most of the people are, has been horrible. Is demand at this point in time, we're the 1st of April, you're going into grilling season, Conceivably, this should be the strongest point. Is demand usually this much of a variable? This time of year, yeah, because usually you have an increase in supply this time of year because all your calves are coming. That's a great question. Your calves are coming to market. We usually have really big numbers from about the middle of April to the middle end of June, and so you need that demand. Now this year, 
I don't know whether we're going to have an increase in supply or not. I'll guarantee you it won't be as big of an increase as it normally is. So if you have your typical demand up, that should really lift prices. But we got to see it first. How much uh, urgency is there to buy cattle right now? <laughs> That's a great question. I think, you know, when we really tanked the live cattle market, finally we broke the, the feeder cattle market. We broke it hard. We really saw the basis in feeder cattle fall away from the board. And they've given us the best value opportunity to buy that we've had in a long time. No, you can now buy cattle that aren't $100 losers to start. It's pretty hard to show a margin, but at least it's, you're not starting in a ginormous hole when you buy cattle. So there is maybe some opportunity out there. Getting any questions about dry lotting cattle this summer? Haven't yet. I've read where a lot of guys are making May 1 be their drop dead day where if it doesn't rain and I don't have any grass by May 1, I'm weaning my calves, I'm pulling off all the old cows, and I'm just going to kind of, you know, circle the wagons and keep my best cows and try to feed them hay and hopefully have it rain. So I imagine that's going to come because I know guys really don't want to get rid of cows if they don't have to because the opportunity for profit's gonna be there this fall if we have cheaper grain, but it's really gonna be a struggle to keep them if there's no grass. Give me your outlook over the next few months here. How, I'm, I don't expect you to be bearish. I know you have the horns <laughs> out. Just tell me how strong they are. I still think we could see record cattle prices going forward. I think we'll see them sometime prior to Memorial Day, and I'm really just going off historicals there because Memorial Day is your biggest beef demand day. And I, you know, nobody really knows what supply is. I know at this feed yard, it's going to be really tight. So it really, really depends on the consumer and what they feel like paying. The, the retail sector has had a really good opportunity to buy beef and feature it during growing season. So I think that could be really good for us. So I, I look for some record beef prices as we go forward. Whether or not we're going to be profitable, that's another story. Next week, we'll look at the wheat markets with North Dakota State Extension Economist Frayn Olson. We should note the World Ag Supply and Demand Estimates report is scheduled to be released next Wednesday at 11 a.m. Central. The USDA Monday resumed its weekly release on crop progress across the country. The numbers weren't good for Nebraska or the nation's winter wheat crop. The top 18 producing winter wheat states saw their wheat rated only 34 percent good to excellent. At the same time last year, that number was 58 percent. Nearly half of Nebraska's crop, 49%, is rated as either poor or very poor. Greg Kruger talked with us Tuesday about the wheat in his area of North Platte and how it compares to a strong crop that region saw a year ago. I don't think it's any surprise we're dry again this year, uh, just like we were last fall. Um, the crop last year, uh, uh, winter wheat crop last year, looked really good for us. So we had pretty good yields, despite uh, the fact that the crop matured off uh, several weeks earlier than our national average or state average but uh, this year I think it could be a really tough year we just lack that precipitation or that soil moisture that uh, we've had the uh, previous few years and if I remember right one of the things that helped you last year was the moisture you got at planting season and that wasn't the case this year yeah so uh, this year uh, even some fields and some farmers were reporting uh, either very poor stands or, 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 or almost no germination at all in some of their fields so I mean, it's pretty dry if we can't get the, the seed at least to, to put a little sprout up and, and overwinter. So. Now, the wheat that UNL has growing out east, uh, right on 84th Street, is greening up, what you'll see in some of the video. But uh, out west, what does it look like where well, you are? Uh, I think we're probably just a little bit behind. Uh, if you think about the layout of the state, we're a little higher elevation, a uh, little cooler temperatures. And we're just not quite to that point that uh, some of the wheat is here in the eastern part of the state. But we're probably not too far behind you guys there. Is that a good thing? Um, I'm a little concerned about that. <laughs> I'm a little concerned. I think that's safe to say. Uh, I, th I think that's probably true for most of our growers yeah. as well. Um, we just, uh, we've just we got a, a few rain showers, a few uh, snowstorms that have put a little bit of moisture in that top three, four inches. There's just not a lot of uh, soil moisture below that to really support a full growing crop. So if we could get a couple nice rains before that really starts to green up and take off, we'll be in much better shape. If it would come out without that moisture, what happens? Oh, <laughs> nothing good. <laughs> yeah, probably not. Uh, yeah. The reality is that I mean, we just don't have a lot of moisture there to, to support a full growing crop. Uh, it's it's not going to burn up uh, in, in the middle of April, but uh, it, it's certainly not going to support a, a high yielding crop if we start to take off uh, and, and don't get any moisture to support it.
So is there a decision to be made now about what to do with it, or is that still a few weeks away and based off of precipitation? Well, Jeff, uh, probably the reality is that we're looking at uh, trying to encourage guys to sit and wait and see what happens. If we don't have enough moisture to support uh, uh, pushing a wheat crop through uh, till July, we're probably not looking at enough moisture to go with any other type of crop. So. Uh, at this point, sitting uh, as tough as it is uh, for our growers is probably the best decision. Is there any option for the livestock producer to, to graze those fields off at some point, perhaps? Uh, yeah, and I, I think we'd want to wait uh, at least a, a few weeks or a month yet before we start to, to do anything drastic there, but uh, certainly that would be an option. Um, if we're not going to have a, a huge wheat uh, yield, then maybe uh, getting, we'll get more out of uh, grazing some of that off. Where are you in precipitation? I mean, obviously last year was not good, but from the first of the year, I mean, have you gotten anything this winter, so, at least uh, in North Platte? In North Platte, uh, we're, we're just a little behind average for the year. Mm -hmm. um, keep in mind that January and February aren't our high rainfall months, but uh, we, we are, even, even with the little bit that we've had, we are a little behind average there, but it's been better than uh, the end of 2012 was. As we close out here, Weed control, because if uh, you know this comes out and it looks like we might get a good crop out of it, what are the things to keep in mind for weed control? Well, uh, hopefully if it stays this dry, we don't see the weeds <laughs> either. But uh, in terms of weed control, I think uh, for wheat, we're probably looking at uh, uh, the same uh, as what we normally would uh, in terms of weed control. Now's probably a good time to start thinking about that if there are some weeds coming through putting down uh, something with a little bit of residual to hold back any weeds that might germinate early in spring. Meanwhile, in the panhandle of the state, not only are dry conditions impacting winter wheat, but a pest is also threatening growers' crops. The Army cutworm can damage winter wheat, alfalfa, rangeland, and turf. UNL Extension entomologist Jeff Bradshaw explains treatment options. There's a number of products, uh, pyrethroids or chlorpyrifos or um, in alfalfa, basically some of the same choices in wheat. And we've got uh, thresholds for those as well, depending on the kind of stress of the plant. If it's pretty highly stressed wheat, for example, threshold would be pretty low, around two um, army cutworms per square foot. And if it's a little bit healthier, it'd be closer to four uh, army cutworms per square foot. So threshold's pretty low, but uh, one army worm could do a fair amount of feeding. Jeff says army cutworms also feed on other plants, like sugar beets. He's hopeful the cutworms will finish feeding before sugar beets come up, but encourages growers to scout their fields as plants emerge. With 94% of the state still falling under extreme or exceptional drought, crop producers will, barring a miracle rainfall, begin the 2013 planting season with a sizable moisture deficit. But growers who have the benefit of irrigation, and that number is surely larger this spring, have the ability to provide water once the corn or soybean plant emerges. And this season, some may be thinking about starting their watering systems before the seed even goes in the ground. Daryl Martin talked with us earlier this week about why preseason irrigation might not be such a good idea, even though it may be tempting. Well, people look out and they, they see that it's been, there hasn't been much rainfall over the last year or two, and so there's a, a temptation maybe to put some water down now to get ahead of the game, so to speak. Um, thing they have to realize that April, May, and June are our wettest months of the year in terms of rainfall. So it's very likely in the eastern part of the state that we're going to, certainly in the eastern part of the state, we're going to receive enough rainfall to to carry us through maybe, so to speak. We know that the rain-fed fields are probably drier than average, but in those irrigated fields, is it possible that some of that water is still left over from last season? Yeah, sure, it all depends on how people ended up last season, where that irrigated field is at. I mean, I saw a lot of people, since it was so dry last, uh, last summer, that were irrigating maybe a little bit later than normal, and those people may be in pretty good shape, quite frankly. Um, some people who maybe were a little limited on how much water they could pump, either because of an allocation or maybe a low well capacity, they may be a little bit drier this spring than normal. And so maybe some concern there to, to put some water in. But boy, a lot of the research shows it's, it's, um, it's, not a very, it's not a real good strategy very often. Let's go through a few of those, both in capacity and then in, in an allocation situation. Is there any way it would pay off in an allocation situation where you only can pump a certain number of inches per year? Well, in those cases, I, I think I would be very, very careful with that. Um, you know, the likelihood of getting some rain and, and then uh, having some of the water you put on preseason irrigation maybe leads to that profile could be, uh, could be a real detriment to you. You're kind of losing your valuable resource doing that. So, you know, I'd be very careful in, in trying to do that, I think. Um, the other areas, if you're really in low capacity wells, 
Uh, there's some research done by colleagues in, in Kansas, at Tribune, mm -hmm. Kansas. And that's uh, right on the Colorado, um, Kansas border. They get about 17 inches of rain a year. And, and they showed that if your uh, capacity of your well is less than about 500 gallon a minute on a 130 acre pivot, that you know maybe there's a little bit of return to pre-irrigate. But if you had a larger capacity than that, then they weren't showing much, uh, much benefit at all. And, and some likelihood that you're uh, pumping water, you wouldn't get any value out of it. Why isn't it working? Why doesn't it work? Why doesn't it stay in that soil profile? Well, it, it, it may, again, April, May, and June okay. are our wettest months of the year, and so if we get the rain and it fills the profile up. And so it's not that it's not staying there, it's just that you might get that water anyway. Exactly. That's what it is. That's right, exactly that's right. Is there any difference between if you're, you know, if you're thinking about doing this, is there any difference between planting beans and corn? Uh, because obviously corn is gonna need more water right away, most likely. Yeah, corn's probably going to be a little more sensitive to preseason irrigation, although corn's a very tough crop. Uh, both crops are pretty tough. So it might be a little bit more beneficial to irrigate on uh, pre-irrigate on the corn than the soybeans. But certainly the eastern half of the state, I don't see much likelihood of it being worthwhile. What we really encourage people to do is take a soil probe and go out and probe in that field down two, three feet, four if they can get there, and um, look at that soil water maybe in the first part of June. Generally, we have enough capacity in our wells to be able to put some water down early in June before we hit that peak use period. And by then, we'll know a lot more about what our precipitation looks like before the season starts. What do you want to see in that profile? How much water do you want to see in there? Well, you know, and it, again, that's going to depend on capacity sure. of your well. If you have a really nice capacity well, you know, we'd like to be up that 75% of field capacity. Uh, we'd like to leave room for any rain that we would get in June. If we have a little low capacity well, I would like to end up June pretty close to field capacity in those fields if I have a really low capacity well. Final question, if there isn't rain in your area before planting season, I, th I think there maybe would be a temptation to put a little water down to make sure that th you're not planting into an absolutely dry seed bed. Is there mm -hmm. any argument for that? Well, um, we, we hear a lot of that. A lot of times, again, I think it, it, it's marginal in terms of mm -hmm. its payback. Some of that's gonna depend on how you till. If you're in a, in a reduced tillage system, it's probably pretty likely that you're gonna have some good soil moisture at the surface. If you happen to be in a tillage situation for some reason, maybe you've dried those top inch or two out, then, then it's a little more likely that it'd be beneficial to you. But generally speaking, it's, it's not a, a good gamble, especially again in eastern Nebraska. Now on the Market Journal website, we've linked to an article on preseason irrigation if you're interested in finding more information. Introduced to the United States in 2000, they thrive in temperatures between 70 and 85 degrees Fahrenheit. At a size of 1 16th of an inch, they draw farmers to fields with magnifying or, depending on the eye, reading glasses. Soybean aphids damage their host plant by feeding on the underside of leaves and reducing photosynthesis. In ideal conditions, a soybean aphid population can double in as little as two or three days. First found in Nebraska in 2002, soybean aphids can decrease yield by over 30% in this state, and the University of Minnesota has found aphids can cut production nearly in half. Now University of Nebraska researchers are working on a seed variety that may dramatically lessen the impact of the small yellow pest. Our discussion with Tom Hunt at the Haskell Ag Lab near Concord explains how. Well, we've been working with Dr. Tiffany Hang Moss down in Lincoln on soybean aphid resistance to soybean aphids. And this is a type of management tool that doesn't require insecticide use, um, is uh, built into the plant, so can provide a really good way for farmers to deal with soybean aphids. Is there something like this that exists outside of the Midwest, in other countries, anything like that? Um, resistance is something that is in a lot of different plants. People look at it and are using it across the country, but the type of resistance they're looking at and using primarily is antibiotic resistance which is a single gene resistance that has a del del deleterious effect on the aphid. We've found a soybean variety that has tolerance to soybean aphids. In other words, the plant can tolerate more aphids and injury without the subsequent severe yield loss that we see with other varieties. Meaning what for the farmer? What does it allow him or her to do? Well, the farmer has more flexibility. One of the things about soybean aphids is they hit and, they, and the populations build fast. So farmers either catch it a little bit late, so they lose some yield, 
or they catch it just in time, but there's delays in treating it because of a backup of equipment or something like that. So this allows more flexibility. The farmer has more time before he gets severe damage, and even if he misses it, he's not going to get the 30, 40 percent damage that he would get with regular varieties. He may get up to almost, you know, maybe 13, 10, 13 percent damage. We're just a stone's throw away from the Haskell Ag Lab here in Concord. You've grown this variety here on land around this, correct? Yes, it started out as a germplasm from Kansas. We got it from some of our collaborators in Kansas, and so in the last few years we built up seed stocks and so two years ago we had enough to do a regular large plot trial and we saw a severe insect infestation but we only had about a 13 percent yield loss where we would have expected up to a 35 percent yield loss so that indicated that yes indeed under field conditions it does have tolerance to soybean aphid injury. You mentioned Kansas explain to me how this kind of came about. Well, our collaborators in Kansas uh, were using actually this variety as a susceptible line for their resistance work. They were looking for antibiosis and they do a lot of their screening at the seedling stages. And this soybean line, you know, produced high numbers of aphids, so they used it to compare to other lines to see if they had uh, some antibiotic characteristics and had lower aphid numbers. Indeed it did. Well, as we looked at it, we saw, yes, it, it does hold a lot of aphids. Um, let's grow it a little longer and see if it can sustain that and yield, and, and it did. It uh, Actually, when we looked at it in reproductive stages, it showed tolerance and, and it showed that the yield loss was not as severe. So that's how we started to look at this aphid and, uh, or soybean line and, and uh, testing it with aphids both in the greenhouse and in the field. Is there any trade-off? Does it, you know, if you use this line, does it make the soybean more susceptible to anything else that you found? Uh, not that we've found. We will be looking at that further. Uh, Dr. Graff, our soybean breeder at UNL, is going to be looking at it in his breeding studies and trials. And so we're going to look at it. Hopefully we can put some uh, antibiotic genes into that line also and uh, uh, build a higher yielding soybean and, and hopefully suitable for Nebraska farmers. Why is it so hard to, to, to find something like this, to find a variety that, that doesn't necessarily have it? Because there isn't necessarily a line that has more resistance, is there, or that has this out there? Well, the problem with tolerance, uh, or I shouldn't say problem, but the thing with tolerance <laughs> is it's multigenic. A lot of genes are involved. With antibiotic resistance, it's usually a single gene, so breeders can really, really focus on that and use it in breeding studies and, and, uh, and breeding programs. But with tolerance and multi-genes, it's harder to deal with that. But Meaning nowadays- what? Because there's, there's so many things you have to put your finger on, essentially? There's so many genes involved in the resistance so that when it's hard to identify the particular block of okay. genes or, or, or move them around. But now with certain molecular techniques and with the ability to look at off-on regulation of various groups of genes, we can identify those uh, lines that have these genes. Um, we can look at the mechanisms of resistance and, and we can then use them in uh, breeding programs such as Dr. Graff is going to begin to do. Now with his weekly weather forecast, here's UNL Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well folks, here we are again for the weekly forecast. Of course, we have an impending storm system that is expected to move out of the western United States and impact the central plains and pr produce some pretty significant moisture across some portions of Kansas and possibly even Nebraska. Before we get to that main forecast, let's take a look at what's happened during this last week. And of course, the major news was the precipitation event that hit us last weekend, particularly the areas of the eastern two-thirds of the state and particularly south and south of the Platte River Valley where precipitation totals were a little bit greater than we were in the northern part of the state. Northern part of the state, quarter to half an inch was pretty common. That's south of the Platte River. We've seen uh, precipitation increasing up to uh, about an inch and a half in some of the isolated thunderstorms that did develop. We actually had a tornado confirmed in the North Platte region. So it is a sign of spring and of course with the weather going forward we are expecting to see the chance for some very significant moisture and possibly even some accumulated snowfall as we get into the middle part of next week. So let's take a look at the upper air models and see how this is going to progress as we go through this next seven day period. And as we go to the upper air models, the first thing I'll draw your attention to is a piece of energy that moved through the state during this last 24 hour period has now moved to the east of us. And we did have some scattered shower activity across the state, nothing major. And we aren't expecting much in the way of precipitation today, so it looks like it will be fairly good conditions in regards to the spring game in Lincoln. There may be some precipitation breaking out as we get into the afternoon and evening hours as another piece of energy tries to scoot through the state. It's very weak as we have this trough moving into the western United States. So by the time we get to tomorrow, you'll see there is a little bit of troughiness there. And we might sh sh touch off a few scattered showers and possibly even a thunderstorm. But again, we're not looking for a lot of uh, significant coverage. It's going to be hit and miss. But the main activity starts to come in as we get into the Monday time frame. And you'll notice this low start to really dig down to the desert southwest. It's going to pump a lot of warm air and moist air up from the Gulf of Mexico in advance of this system. 
and really start to get the system in the lower atmosphere wetted up enough that we should start producing some substantial rainfall, particularly as we get into Monday evening. And by the time we get into Tuesday, this low will really have itself cranked up in southeastern Colorado. And we could see some severe weather in some locations of eastern Nebraska. It's kind of iffy right now, but definitely thunder is in the possibility. And with this feed into our region, we're expecting some heavy precipitation. In fact, the models are indicating with this event that most areas of the state should at least receive an inch of moisture with possibly up to two inches plus in the southeastern corner and potentially even that in the southwestern corner in the southern panhandle if the snow does get cranked up as we get into Wednesday. So by the time we get to Wednesday, one of the systems starts to move up to the Great Lakes and start to pull in some pretty significant air behind it and that should produce some uh, snowfall on the back side of it, particularly during the overnight hours. The, the accumulations are really going to be dependent on, on the uh, temperatures of the surface, and of course we would expect with these warmer temperatures we've been receiving lately that that's going to limit the snowfall accumulations, but it wouldn't surprise me, and we need to pay attention to the weather, that this could really crank out some significant snowfall, particularly in some of the drought-stricken areas of western Nebraska that desperately need the moisture. Now by the time we get to Thursday, the system starts to clear our region, we start to get a little cooler northwesterly flow on the back side of it, and by the time we get to Friday, we'll notice that the ridge starts to build back into our region, so we'll start to see warmer temperatures. So let's take a look at the specifics. In terms of the specifics, we're looking at fairly mild temperatures weekend with just a slighter scatter chance of thunderstorm activity on Sunday. And as we get into Tuesday, that's when our main precipitation event rolls into our region. We should see widespread rainfall, some thunderstorm activity possible, maybe even severe. And as we get into Wednesday, start to get cooler conditions with rainfall and snow breaking out during the overnight hours and clearing the system state as we get into the day on Thursday. In terms of the 8 to 14 day forecast next through the following Tuesday, uh, I think they may be overdoing this colder air in our region, but it looks like we'll be closer to normal in terms of precipitation. Most of the precipitation will stay well east of the state. Thanks, Al. Our interviews from this episode with Mike Briggs, Greg Kruger, Daryl Martin, and Tom Hunt are available on the Market Journal website as part of the April 5th episode. Next week, Frayne Olson will analyze the wheat markets. Brad Lubin will look at acre versus direct and countercyclical farm program enrollment. And Rick Rasby will update us on the calving season. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Soybeans are found on dinner tables around the world. Some form of the soybean is found in baby foods, snacks, cooking oils, and many other food items eaten daily. And soybeans provide the protein in the diets for livestock and fish. The Nebraska soybean farmers support research to develop new soy-based products for foods, livestock, and industrial uses through their checkoff dollars. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up.